Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to have you all here. Uh, my name is Arno Lorenz. I'm the Global Investment Strategist for Ashburton. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is really the long road ahead uh, in terms of where we as investors are essentially faced with all of these different risks and how we're going to try and navigate through them. So hopefully it gives you some insights as to what we're thinking about at the moment, uh, how we plan on navigating our portfolios through this. I look after the global multi-asset portfolios, so it does give us a lot of leeway and room to be able to invest globally to seek out the growth opportunities where they are. Uh, there are not too many of them at the moment, but hopefully we will position uh, ourselves correctly going forward. So let me jump then into uh, the way we stand at the moment. And so certainly from the perspective of the virus itself, we, we know this is the dominant factor determining where markets go to. Perhaps one way to look at this is to essentially look at the different countries. And you perhaps have seen many of these sorts of charts before plotting the curves, the, the infection curves in terms of cases across various countries. And what I've show, I'm showing you here is essentially the top 10 most populated countries in the world. Uh, and that gives you some sense of the differentiation between some of these countries. So you can clearly see the China experience in terms of being first in and essentially first out, I suppose, in, in one way to do it. And then of course, United States uh, still attempting to flatten their curve. And then everyone else behind them in terms of these top 10 countries are essentially only just sort of getting towards uh, some form of flattening of the curve. And so one of the things that we have to think about here is that, you know, for these countries where essentially we have the, de the perhaps some of the most densely populated countries, if one thinks about a country like Bangladesh, for example, enormously uh, densely populated and one of the most densely populated countries in the world, and yet a tiny country. So certainly in terms of risk mitigation for a health crisis, because that becomes enormously difficult. So certainly this global wave of infections is not over yet. I think this is the important point that we would have to emphasize here is that perhaps even the worst of what is still to come lies in these countries and emerging markets in particular. And it, it starts to inform us in terms of the investment strategy that we would want to follow in terms of where regionally we would want to invest if we have the ability to invest globally. So just the one thing here is that we have to understand is that given the uncertainties and the unknowns that we're dealing with in this crisis as a, as a medical or healthcare crisis, is that a lot of the information that we would require is essentially unknown at this stage. So every single day that goes by, uh, the healthcare professionals have more information and a better ability to essentially plan their way around this. So certainly if, if, if one thinks about, you know, the first three blocks that you can see here, for example, at the moment, is that averting the healthcare disaster is priority number one. So it's the saving lives part of, of things. In doing so, obviously, we have basically brought the global economy to essentially some form of hibernation. And so the next step would be to avert a systemic crisis. And we've seen this uh, enormous search for liquidity around the world, liquidity provision by central banks, monetary policy stimulus. Uh, and once you've essentially moved beyond that, you can then start to say, well, now, how do we start dealing with the, the livelihoods side of things? So mitigating the socioeconomic impacts of what has been done. And we've seen the issues around this, tax breaks, fiscal stimulus, small business supports, et cetera, uh, around the world. And then we can start to move into things like medical interventions, the drugs that can be used for therapeutic purposes, it's talking about a uh, vaccine and so forth. And the last point here is really sort of around getting back to some sense of normality. Uh, which is essentially uh, going to be an incredibly important one for us to uh, to think about in terms of, uh, you know, the, how long does the, the fiscal stimulus last for? How long does monetary policy stimulus last for? What are the shifts that we start seeing in terms of, uh, you know, government policy around healthcare and, and, and so forth? And certainly there'll be a lot of opportunities that we'll be able to start dealing with. And of course, the other part of things is, you know, in terms of our, our, our behavioral pattern side of things, you know, uh, the new normal, it means we're not going to be doing work in the same way as we did before. And then the last bit we'd have to perhaps think about, well, you know, even if we have worst case scenario, it ends with some form of a vaccination program. And the question will be, well, who gets vaccinated first? Is it the older people that are more vulnerable? Is it the workforce? Uh, or is it healthcare workers? 
uh, because not everybody can be vaccinated at the same time. So these are the sorts of you know, ethical, moral questions that we will start to negotiate as we start moving forward. So just in terms then of, you know, what does this thing point us towards? So the first thing is, is that growth is likely to be, even with current consensus being negative from a global context, is it's likely to still be even worse than that. So there are still a lot of dominoes that are starting to fall. And certainly what the science tells us is that the social distancing phenomenon, if you want to put it like that, is probably going to be remain with us for at least the rest of this year. And it will be in the form of rolling social inter uh, distancing in the sense of you will release the, 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 the lockdown. Uh, and when there are certain indicators that start to point towards another wave of infections, what are the cases, it might be reimposed. So certainly that is the sort of approach that we will see. And so certainly that puts a damper on any expectation of a very sharp V-shaped recovery. So I think, you know, we've started to see people talk about a U-shaped recovery. Some people even speak about a W-shape. You know, I think that the, the increasing likelihood is that a sharp V-shaped recovery is highly unlikely at this stage. On a monetary policy uh, context, we've seen enormous shifts around the world. So interest rates being cut, and I'm going to show you a couple of charts a little bit later. But the liquidity injection to ensure that the, the, the financial crisis component is, is averted is a good thing. But the question we would perhaps have is it points to, well, are we in something like 2008, where you know, we had fiscal stimulus, we had monetary policy stimulus, uh, and then we sort of emerged from that. And essentially, if you look back to 2008, 2009, perhaps the, 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 the lesson that we had there was, well, don't fight the Fed. Don't fight the central banks because eventually they'll get this thing right. So we'll examine this as well. Of course, one thing I'll, I'll highlight here in, in, right at this point is that we'd have to look at valuations. So in terms of going off and buying risk assets, we'd have to question, are they essentially pricing in the right sort of environment and scenario going forward? On the fiscal side of things, is it's important that we've seen fiscal stimulus to support small businesses, consumers, and so forth. But the, the, the one issue that we have here is that unlike the monetary policy stimulus, it's been very uncoordinated. And I'll show you, uh, take you through some of those issues as well. So the, the likelihood is that we're looking at an uneven economic recovery around the globe. So certainly what it speaks to then is the fact that in terms of investing, it's not just a blanket global approach to investing. So certainly in that respect, uh, we, we would have to be quite uh, specific around where we actually take risk. And lastly, the point I'll leave with is that there will be casualties. So in particular around corporates. So even today, for example, uh, one of the research reports I was looking at was speaking about the death of the department store. And in South Africa, we even see this in, in a sense around Edcon, for example. So the, the length of time it takes before some of these uh, businesses fall over varies depending on the underlying business. And certainly we are not going to get through this unscathed. Right, so in talking through the, the fiscal stimulus side, side of things, is that what I spoke to you a little bit earlier was that around the world, we've seen fiscal stimulus of varying degrees. And an important component here to think about when we are looking at where to invest around the world is to try, try to understand the dynamics that will play out here. In particular, if one thinks about the divisions between the, the developed world on one hand and the, the, the emerging markets on, on the other hand. Very similar to that first slide I showed in terms of the different paths around the most populous countries of, of, of the world. So if you look at this chart, for example, uh, illustrating your fiscal stimulus, so increasing fiscal stimulus here. So if you look at, for example, uh, Britain, the US, and we know the US has already announced further packages, Japan, you know, these are the, pretty much the developed world. But in terms of measuring it against the stringency index, in terms of lockdown type of uh, approach, the countries that have implemented the strictest lockdown approach are the ones that have actually provided the least amount of fiscal stimulus. It's quite an interesting phenomenon there. And so, you know, if one thinks about these countries, India, Argentina, and the like, who essentially have less of a capacity, in fact, to provide fiscal stimulus, and we know that it is the lockdown itself that causes the economic impact, the negative impact. So from that perspective, we will fast approach this uh, tension between the, the ability to provide uh, some form of safety net through fiscal stimulus versus 
quest to save lives. And so this tension is the important one for these sorts of countries. And certainly from that perspective, this uncoordinated approach in terms of fiscal policy will play a major role in terms of each country's different experience uh, from that perspective. On the monetary policy side, as I alluded to earlier, is that countries have in fact been very, very coordinated. So certainly if one thinks about it from an extraordinary central bank stimulus side of things, uh, it's all been uh, very, very coordinated from the perspective of what, the, what the, uh, the, the global central banks have done. And certainly from that perspective, it has been, I suppose in a sense, been quite uh, uh, rewarding to be able to see that central banks have been able to coordinate to that degree. But Again, I reiterate the fiscal stimulus being more important than the monetary at this stage. Why? Because consumers sitting at home cannot make use of lower interest rates at this stage. Normal consumption patterns uh, will not be able to resume for quite some time. Having said that, is these lower interest rates certainly will be a help to businesses who will have to leverage themselves in order to get through the crisis. Okay, so if we think about trying to determine where do we get to as far as uh, the, the, the market is concerned. So if we go back to 2008, you can see the response in a monetary policy term, when the Fed had hit rock bottom in 2000, December 2008, the investment market turned in March of 2009. So it took a little bit of a lag before the, market, the, the, the equity market turned. So we could question and say, well, we reached rock bottom in terms of monetary policy, or maximum stimulus in March of 2020. So how long will it take before the market bottoms and starts moving uh, upwards again? Well, to a certain degree, we, we already have seen this. So here, for example, is this S&P 500. We can see the response of markets in the realization that there was going to be a, a global pandemic. And so that fear that drove markets down 34% in this initial move, uh, and then on March the 16th, so somewhere around about here, we saw the Fed cutting rates to zero. So they got to zero basically by mid-March. Uh, by the 23rd of March, that was the, the very bottom that we've seen so far, the market bottomed, and since then there's been this recovery. In the belief that the monetary policy stimulus and the fiscal stimulus and all the other measures in place will essentially be there to provide the support such that through the lockdown, despite the, some of the casualties, is if this would be a good time to buy. Why? Because essentially the market is saying we can look through this. The authorities, whether the fiscal side or monetary side, have done enough to be able to get us through this, even though we know it's still going to take some time. So this is a key question that we have to answer. And this is the reason why I, I perhaps pose the question, well, is this then simply like 2008, 2009, don't fight the Fed? Uh, and so certainly I would say that one of the things we'd have to do is then to say, well, how long is it before we get to that emergence out of this from an economic perspective? So let me pose, uh, pose a couple of uh, scenarios here. This would be the base case. It's the fact that we'd have gradual lifting of the lockdowns through mid-2020 with an imposition of some targeted restrictions in countries that are lagging perhaps at different times because they've followed different models in terms of lockdown. So, for example, if I use uh, one that comes to mind would be Turkey, where they've had a lockdown and they've released that to some degree, where they now have a curfew on weekends completely. Uh, but if you are younger than 20 or older than 65, well, then you still have to stay at home. Uh, some people might look at it, that and say, well, that's quite a strange uh, lockdown to have in place. But nonetheless, let's disregard that. But to point the fact that not every country has followed the same sort of lockdown, as I've uh, sort of alluded to here, is that some developed uh, markets and, and other countries haven't even imposed lockdowns. So certainly the, 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 the base case would be that there is a lag uh, effect here that we are looking at. But in terms of the space case, we believe that this is the most likely scenario that globally restrictions will be unlikely in complete uh, sense to be removed or lifted for at least another 12 months such that you have some sort of uh, inter medical interventions or you would have uh, the healthcare system becoming more robust in the sense of increasing the number of uh, hospital beds and so forth. So that even if there is a resurgent, resurgence, you would be able to cope with the, the healthcare component. Let's look at the upside case. The upside case, which I, I would perhaps posit here, would be something like what you are seeing in the US, 
more in hope than anything else, which is that you impose a lockdown, you see the results, cases, new cases start falling, uh, and you are able to exit quickly and, and then move on where you do tracking, tracing, testing. Uh, that would be the upside case, following something like the China or South Korean model. And that if that were the case, then certainly most of the models that uh, uh, the scientists are producing would then point to the fact that on a global basis, the pandemic is over by late May and beginning June. And so beyond that, then you'd have probably a full resumption of, of economic activity. Granted, the, the spread of activity would be different, but by the third quarter and moving into the end of this year, you essentially have a full resumption of economic activity such that you start emerging and you have then the base of monetary and fiscal stimulus there as well as a safety net. The downside side of things, of course, is perhaps uh, the one which we'd have to examine. Sorry, I just went a bit too quickly there. And this is the unsynchronized uh, uh, sort of lockdowns and the subsequent ret uh, retractions from that. But the downside scenario would be, you move out of lockdown too early, we don't yet have any medical interventions other than being able to provide a hospital bed for those who are ill. So being able to treat people with therapeutic drugs or that a, a vaccine hasn't arrived and that you then have a second and even third wave, very much like for those of you that followed these sorts of models, the Imperial model that came out uh, in early uh, March, which spoke to essentially lockdown, release, lockdown, release to varying degrees before you eventually get to the vaccine stage. This downside side of things does mean that you'd also have the risk of a, a re-emergence of the, the infections uh, once we get back into, by the end of this year, into the Northern Hemisphere winter again, uh, coming back from the emerging market or the global south side of things. And that what this scenario points to is a still widespread lockdown, uh, inability to resume normal economic activity until a vaccine arrives, as the science points to 12 to 18 months down the line. So if one wants to put probabilities around this, probably what we would, uh, something like base case is something like 55 to 65% probability. The upside case is something like a 10 to 15% probability at this stage. And the downside, uh, we'd probably be looking somewhere in the region of a 30% side of things. So certainly a significant risk for the downside. And in terms of for investment markets, it would be wise to take that into consideration. So what are the signals that we're looking at uh, as far as the market is concerned in terms of recovery, which point us towards, well, which case are we going for? Is it upside? Is it downside? How are things playing out? So yeah, I'm speaking not so much about, you know, the number of infections, uh, whether the lockdown works, et cetera, et cetera. I'm speaking purely around the economic recovery. And what I've highlighted here is the consumer confidence. So even if you were to remove a lockdown, and if we were able through social distancing to prevent any widespread breakout or, or, or new infections, is consumer confidence and business confidence remain probably the key to resumption of economic activity. Why? Well, put it like this. If they were tomorrow to release the lockdown, would you want to get onto a plane and go and travel to wherever it was, knowing that you're in close contact with other people? And the answer would be probably not. And the reason why is comes down to a simple thing called trust. You need to be able to trust that when you go to uh, a particular uh, venue or whether you travel on a particular means of transport, that you can have a reasonable trust that the people around you are not infected. Can we say that at this point in time? And the answer would be no, you can't. And so consumption patterns will not resume until that is in place. And certainly the one ingredient for that confidence or, or trust would be widespread uh, testing. And so certainly if one, and I'm sure everybody that even looks at the news, because there is no other news at the moment, would know that uh, one of the things that we've seen in the, the South Korea model, the China model has been, it's based on number one, widespread testing. Number two, on tracing, if you do detect somebody that's positive. So certainly from that perspective, when we get that on a global scale, consumer confidence and business confidence can start to resume such that we know that people can go out and make use of these low interest rates and the tax breaks and so forth. So certainly I'm not going to go through all of these indicators and certainly uh, uh, the whole range of these that we would want to look at basically, but certainly they are there. There are signals we can use in terms of being able to determine whether we are on the right track and hopefully 
on some sort of upside uh, track. So what are the likely outcomes then uh, in terms of the market side of things? Certainly the one thing which uh, people have spoken about and which market analysts have been talking about is inflation. So the, the, the usual fears when you have interest rates at zero and you have enormous fiscal stimulus, then one of the things that you start talking about is, well, with all of this printing of money, surely it's going to be an inflationary re regime at some point in time. Let's point it out that the current crisis mode is inherently disinflationary. And we all understand this. If you're not able to go out and spend, it doesn't matter what your interest rate is. So it's not the creation of money then in, in that sense. So if you look at this chart, for example, uh, going back over uh, the last 50 odd years, what it points to, of course, in the blue line is your core inflation in the US. And you can see it's been in a downward trend and there's only been one significant shock, essentially one inflationary shock, which was the 1970s. And since then, it's been pretty much one way traffic as far as inflation is concerned. If you look at the 2008-2009 experience here, where there was an, an, an immediate impact as far as inflation was concerned, and then it very much resumed a normal pattern. So the question we would ask is, well, what's different this time in the sense of that initially it's inherently disinflationary, and then when we get back to normal activity, why will it become inherently inflationary from that perspective? And maybe I'll touch on a little bit of this around the fears that uh, will drive this. And so certainly from the perspective of the market spheres is that this the, the, the fiscal stimulus will be monetized to the extent that then you will see uh, essentially uh, inflation starting an upward trend. And if that were the case, and if the market expected an upward trend, it is that fear of inflation more than the actual inflation, which will drive assets like, for example, gold or inflation linkers in terms of protecting against future inflation, which would do be very uh, good for these sorts of assets. So certainly in our mind, and certainly we have been uh, positioned within gold in order to take advantage of this, and it's done very well for us over the last month or so, and I'll come back to these positions. So certainly it's just the fear, but we don't think that we are of necessity moving into a long-term inflationary pattern uh, because of this fiscal and monetary policy stimulus. Think about what the, the, the experience was. Despite the fact that interest rates were held at zero from 2000 and late 2008 all the way through to 20, uh, 2016, 2017, is that we never saw a resumption of a, an increasing uh, inflation trend. And so certainly one can see short bursts of inflation, but nothing to the extent that we would have to be concerned about. And of course, if one were to then factor in what's happened with the oil price, uh, which is also another disinflationary inflationary force as well, it certainly points towards, for the foreseeable future at the very least, uh, a low inflation environment. Which then brings us then to let's talk about the equity market and whether we've reached rock bottom. I alluded to the fact that in 2008, 2009, you had very uh, 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 sort of low interest rates. We got there in March, of, uh, in December 20, 2008, the equity market bottomed in 2009, and it was almost one way traffic going forward for the next six, uh, seven years, basically. So here's the question, which is valuations do count. If one looks at the forward PE of the S&P 500, is that just before the crisis struck, we were sitting at elevated levels. In the immediate aftermath of the, the, the shock, remember that 34% down move that we had from middle of February to the middle of March, uh, we saw valuations getting down to something approaching sort of some, somewhere like the last three or four years average. But, at, but the, the thing that did not change enough were the expectations around earnings. And so certainly based on current forecasts on earnings is the market actually appears to be more expensive than when it started this crisis. And so certainly if one thinks about this in the perspective of a uncertainty index being at very, very high levels uh, over this period of time and certainly in the policy uncertainty, one would have to question this assumption that We've had a fall, and in absolute terms, the market is currently sitting at perhaps something like 13% lower than where it was at the start of the year, is in, on a valuation basis, one would perhaps have to have a measure of caution around going into the equity market, given the current consensus around earnings. And this current consensus is still premised in our minds around somewhat of a V-shaped type recovery, that there will be a quick 
uh, recovery, almost pointing towards a upside scenario as far as this exit is concerned. And certainly in our mind, you'll, uh, our, our expectation is that upside scenario has perhaps a 15% probability, the good scenario. And so certainly we believe that you'd have to think about that these earnings forecasts have to start being lowered even further. And of course, what it does mean is that if we start to see this and we're entering into the earnings season in the US, is that if we start to see this, then the, 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 we might well see the equity market falter somewhat despite this maximum stimulus. And so despite this sort of don't fight the Fed approach to, to investing. Of course, the other side of the market is not just the, the equity component, but also the fixed income component. So if one thinks about US Treasury bond yields, we've seen where they're trading at the moment, uh, pretty much at uh, all time lows, if we think about the, the last number of decades. One, driven by obviously the underlying inflation side of things, and two, driven by the search for a safe haven. And of course, US Treasury bonds are the ultimate safe haven. In terms of credit risk, uh, essentially the US can print money, uh, so the risk of a default is probably fairly slim. Uh, it's very liquid and it's been based in dollars. So from that perspective, it has proven to be the ultimate safe haven. And certainly we see, we saw this uh, collapse in bond yields, you know, from the beginning of the year uh, uh, of around about 2% down to around about 0.3% before it was a little bit of a retraction uh, and sort of holding it around about the 0.6% uh, for the, for the 10 year yields. And so certainly the question we'd ask in the fixed income spaces, if you're going offshore from a South African perspective and wanting to look into the equity market, we'd say be cautious around valuations, but then let's look at the bond market. Are you going to get return? If you buy US treasuries at this point in time from a lot, with, a, with a fairly lengthy investment horizon, essentially you're locking in a 0.6% return for the next 10 years if you're going to stay there for the next 10 years. So certainly in our mind, it's been the beneficiary of safe haven flows. And once we emerge on the other side, and even in the worst case scenario, we have not said that this is going to persist for the next two to three years. So at some point in time, these safe haven flows will essentially move away from these sorts of assets into uh, risk on type assets. And so certainly from our perspective is that if you think about a downwards, downside scenario, perhaps US treasuries could rally from this point in time. But our base case speaks to the fact that we are probably in that space where it will probably move sideways. And hence, in our mind, this is not the time, if you are in that base case uh, or upside scenario frame of mind, to be uh, investing into the fixed income space. Of course, in fixed income, what would then be uh, sort of your go-to space would be looking at uh, you know, emerging market side of things. But having said that, I would temper it, of course, with that point I made earlier, which is that from a perspective of that they are lagging the developed world in terms of their curve and their approach to lockdowns and so forth, is that uh, from that perspective, we don't know how it's going to play out yet. And so certainly the economic impacts are not yet fully understood. Okay, so let's then think about where do we get to after the crisis. I'll run through this in terms of the bigger picture side of things. So certainly we will most likely avoid a systemic crisis in most of the developed world. Why? Because they have the ability to essentially provide the fiscal stimulus. In the global south, and in particular, we speak about the Latin American countries, uh, Africa, and some of the uh, uh, Asian emerging markets. We can't say that yet. So from a perspective of looking for investment destinations, it would be a brave person who would go out and say, well, it's all in the price already because we simply don't know. And, and, and while in investment space, we do, most of the time we don't know, uh, what we're dealing with here is an underlying virus that we have very little knowledge about. So certainly, as I say, it would be very brave of us to make assumptions that what played out in the developed world will play out in the same way in the emerging markets. So certainly some caution around that. The next one would be questions about the sustainability of fiscal and monetary support. So we saw in 2008 to 2009 is that the Fed could keep their stimulus there for a very long period of time. Again, how long will they be able to do this going forward as well and in terms of the fiscal side of things? So certainly, uh, if this is the downside scenario, we would have to question some of the country's ability to be able to navigate through this without something falling over. Obviously, as I alluded to earlier, questions or concerns around the monetization of this global debt that's building up, 
And so certainly the fear of inflation, very much supportive for inflation protected assets like the gold, like inflation linked bonds and so forth. Um, and so certainly if one thinks about it in a, in a much broader context, uh, the last time we saw this level of fiscal stimulus was after, it was during the Second World War. And if one thought about, well, what happened after the Second World War to be able to essentially pay back this debt? And the one thing that came about in most of the developed world was higher taxes. Now, certainly in a South African context, in terms of our fiscal stimulus, let's look at how will South Africa navigate this by essentially providing all of this enormous fiscal stimulus. Who pays for it? And these are the, the issues we have to think about. Is it the taxpayers or do we allow this essentially to be monetized in the sense of allowing higher inflation to eat away the real value of the debt? Those are issues that we are still going to have to address at some point in time. On an overall basis, though, uh, from a, a macro perspective, certainly we would look at it and say the asset pricing we've seen so far in the equity space versus the repricing we've seen in the bond space points to the fact that if you have a long investment horizon, and what is long in today's world, we're probably talking about three years, five years from this point in time. It certainly points to the fact that you will get better returns out of the equity market relative to fixed income. If you're a South African investor and you're looking offshore, it makes sense then if you're looking for a fixed income or income component, local bonds offer you better value than offshore bonds. That, that is a reality that we're dealing with at this stage. From a corporate perspective, if we think about how companies will emerge from this, and these are essentially the ones that are not casualties. So here we're talking about trying to look at how companies are going to respond to a new environment. And so certainly those companies who have had to increase leverage or who already had higher leverage at this point in time going into this crisis will have to focus on reducing leverage going forward. And one way that they will also have to essentially smooth out their curve of interest payments as well, because you can't assume as a corporate that your cost of capital is going to remain low forever, is that you will want to perhaps seek to increase the maturity of your debt. So moving away from short-term uh, 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 short debt to longer-term uh, debt. And so it, one encapsulates this in a sense of companies will be seeking to try to build resilience within their business model. And in one way that they will do this, it, most likely, in particular for multinationals that we would look at, for example, even in our Global Leaders Fund and so forth, uh, that we focus on the quality side of things, is that these companies, multinationals, will seek to diversify their supply chains. How will they do this? Well, geographically, by shifting perhaps some component of their supply chain away from, for example, uh, China or anywhere it has in, in, in some of the other emerging markets to reduce the risk. Why would this be relevant to us? Well, two things. The one is the implication is that in shifting your supply chain, what you move away from is a, the model that has been followed in a global multinational context of the lowest cost supplier in your supply chain. So you move away from the lowest cost to the least risk. And the reason why this is important is because it feeds back then into uh, a, a higher inflation type of environment. So if you're a key component of whatever it is that you produce, uh, is the, and that the, the lowest cost supplier is perhaps, let's call it, say, China, and you decide, well, I'm going to shift it low, closer to home or perhaps to uh, in a geographic context closer to home, you might well find that your component uh, is going to be more expensive. Do you pass that on to the consumer going forward in a recovery environment? Almost certainly. Okay, so this is a key thing that we have to factor in as, as well as far as thinking about companies building resilience. And certainly the focus in investments would be to focus at this stage on companies that have the resilience to see through the crisis and emerge on the other side in a healthy way such that they are, they are able to resume uh, their normal and close to normal uh, economic activities. So from a strategic consideration, if I bring it all together here in terms of you know where do we get to as far as uh, this market and, and uh, an approach to a strategy or investment strategy. Certainly what it, uh, it, it points to us here is that it's too early and it's too uncertain in terms of recovery to go all in as far as risk is concerned. So certainly on the equity space. So certainly with hindsight, perhaps one day uh, somebody might say, oh no, you said that you, it's too early to go all in, but, and you know, in fact it went sideways for perhaps a couple of weeks and then it took off. So certainly at this stage, what we're trying to get to is a balance between 
uh, being able to look through and to say that we want to take risk, but at what uh, cost is that in terms of the underlying uh, preservation of capital side of things. So certainly our approach is to not say we're going all in and completely overweight uh, equities, but our approach is a graduated, and, and here I've sort of put it as point two, a regionally differentiated approach. So here we would essentially uh, avoid the early casualties in the sense of the, the obvious casualties, as well as, being in, as well as increasing risk in those areas or assets where there is a policy backstop. And so here I would highlight in particular investment grade corporate bonds and, and for example in the US, where spreads have blown up completely and yet you know the Fed is there buying uh, these assets to prevent as, as a backstop that there's a complete blowout such that the corporate cost of capital rises too high and that it, there are more casualties. So this is the backstop that they have put in place. So certainly it's one area where we have increased risk as well. The other one would be is to focus on the early implementers. So if one thinks about it from the perspective of a first in first out type approach for countries as well as corporates is those that are being, uh, who are able to essentially get ahead of the curve and implement the right risk adjusted policies in terms of re reducing the lockdowns. And so hence have an earlier recovery a scientifically informed recovery would perhaps be those that we would look at in terms of being able to invest into. On a sectoral basis, of course, is at this stage, again, coming back to the uncertainty and the early stage, is for the time being, uh, we believe that taking an extreme view around certain sectors would perhaps be uh, a little bit too early. So we're fairly neutral as far as that position is concerned, outside obviously of avoiding the obvious casualties. So here we're talking about the tourism side, the airline side and transport in particular. Those are the obvious casualties. So outside of that, we think that there are no uh, sort of obvious uh, sectors that we would want to say in the long term, this is where you want to stay and taking valuations into account. So certainly you can point to, what about the tech? What about the fangs? Uh, yes. But what about valuations is, is the response to that as well. So certainly for the time being, those are the, the resilient side of things. But what we're looking for is, is how do we maximize the return, taking risk into account and valuation risk in particular. In currency terms, the US dollar still remains king. Why? Because it's still early stage, we still have too much uncertainty and certainly liquidity must play an important part in a global portfolio. So certainly if one thinks about it, we know that US dollar is, over, is overvalued on a, 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 a valuation basis. But if one thinks about, well, what are the alternatives? Certainly, which are the currencies that have blown out? Which are the ones that present value? One can highlight an, a whole number of them. The RAND, for example, one could point to and say, well, perhaps here we're sitting with a, a clear opportunity. But what we don't know is how the, the, what the playbook is as far as this virus and the economic impact is in a South African context, despite the fact that uh, we know that the government has done a lot of things very early on and have done mostly all the right things. But it's still too early for us to be able to make a clear call. So if one thinks about a lot of the other emerging market currencies, the Russian ruble, for example, uh, presents itself as one option that one could look at uh, in terms of uh, the resilience around its economy. Certainly those are the sorts of things, but they are not major currencies. And so certainly liquidity wouldn't be an issue for us at this stage. So certainly longer term, we think the US dollar will pull back, but in the near term, it remains uh, in its preferred place of being the, the, the go-to currency. We do believe that one should position for later stage inflation fears through gold, through inflation linkers in particular. And remember what I highlight here is inflation fears not necessarily actual inflation being uh, something that gets out of control. Certainly in, in a current portfolio, given the uncertainties, we believe that one needs to have an element of liquidity underlying one's portfolio. And so certainly this enables quick strategy shifts because we do believe that uh, some of the way that these things play out are unknown at this stage and you want to be able to respond appropriately. If you have zero liquidity and you locked in for the next three or five years, uh, it means that you can't adjust your portfolio appropriately. In the medium term, then also I alluded to this around fixed income, that uh, developed market bond yields are likely to rise. Why? Because of the safe haven shifts. If I bring it then together in terms of where we are around uh, what we've been doing in terms of our global multi-asset portfolios, in the global growth fund, for example, we've been slightly underweight at this stage, uh, 
you know, 58% versus a benchmark of 60. Overweight cash, so hence the liquidity, being able to watch and being able to phase that into the market as, and as we see appropriate when, for example, we see uh, you know, the, the risk-adjusted side of things, so when there are backstops and so forth. So we reduced our emerging market exposure, coming back to that uh, regional differentiation side of things, to zero. We reduced our exposure to Canada, where we were overweight, in favor of gold. Uh, the gold producers, which done really well for us. Uh, we exited India. Why, uh, again, a regional rotation basis. So first in, first out type of approach. Uh, and then within Europe as well, we switched away from smaller company approach to a growth uh, approach. Why? Again, coming back to that resilience component. So certainly that is where we want to be exposed at this point in time. And what we're also considering uh, and, and uh, is under consideration in our side of things is exiting our exposure to India fixed income in favor of the selected investment grade. So again, not blanket investment grade, but certainly selected uh, components of that. Uh, and, and again, one, if one thinks about from emerging market perspective, we certainly believe there's a differentiation even within emerging markets. So if one thinks about the Latin American space, you would have seen that the curves that I showed, for example, around Brazil and so forth in terms of the COVID infection rates. So certainly they are behind the curve, if I can put it like that, relative to the EM uh, Asia pers perspective. So certainly we would want to have a rotation uh, away from a global EM to a very much targeted approach. And then we were also considering in terms of Japanese yen, again, given some of the, the issues that have arisen out of Japan in terms of being behind the curve, perhaps slightly. Uh, so there's some issues around that. So I think I'm going to park it there and I'll end off there and then switch to uh, essentially uh, I will look at uh, taking some questions. Right, so the first question here relates to the outlook being poor for emerging markets in terms of the FX side, the currency side. What is the signal that we're looking for that it, it is time for us to take advantage of that sell-off? And more particularly, would it be when growth deterioration stabilizes, uh, whether there's a plan uh, to revive growth and stabilize the debt, dollar weaknesses, what are the questions or thoughts around that? So certainly from that perspective, uh, in terms of signals, again, as I pointed out, is that from the perspective of that, emerging markets have been very differentiated in the approach to dealing with it. So I highlighted, for example, Turkey. And if you think about for us locally in terms of South Africa, is certainly in my mind, uh, in, in terms of getting through this crisis, and again, for those of you that perhaps have watched uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, in New York, the, the New York uh, governor, I, I just think he puts it so forcefully here, is that in moving beyond a lockdown a, a, a stage, is it comes down to testing, testing, testing. So the one thing I would say here is that when countries are able to implement a widespread testing regime, that for me would be a signal that they are able to move uh, in a robust manner and a sustainable manner. Because I think this is the point here, is it's all very good and well to move out of lockdown and try to get economic recovery going again. But if, one, if you're not able to do it in a sustainable manner because you're not testing, you, you almost certainly run the risk at this point where there's no medical intervention and there's no vaccine that you will have a, a, an emergence of the, the, the infection side. So certainly, if one thinks about it from that perspective, I would have to say, if I'm picking emerging markets, it would have to be those that display the ability to do the testing component. And so certainly, I know that in a South African context, we're getting there, uh, and certainly there have been a lot of comparisons around that. And, and so certainly from that perspective, obviously also and on, on a currency basis, the one big dominant factor here is the US dollar. So every country measures their currency here versus US dollar. And as long as the US has not displayed that they are able to sustainably move out of uh, a lockdown, uh, it will mean that the dollar remains the safe haven. And so if one can see that they are able to move sustainably into uh, that sort of space, then certainly it might well be the case that dollar weakens and, the, and then hence that is a, a positive for emerging market side of things. Okay, so let's have a look. The other side of things is a, the unique challenge uh, that South Africa faces in terms of the widening equality, inequality gap and that this could also uh, result in social problems which you're already seeing. And so this is difficult to 
forecast or, pl or plan for. So this is a very important uh, issue here, which is that if one thinks about it from an emerging market context where, they, where we lack uh, the ability to provide the fiscal side of things. And so certainly in a South African context, we, the only reason why our president was able to announce such a huge uh, fiscal stimulus was because we had to go to the multilateral institutions. And so certainly there will be a payback at some point in time. This is the right thing, but certainly from that perspective, there is a price to be paid a little bit further down the line. And so certainly what we don't know yet is whether uh, when we move, when this virus moves into our poorer communities, is how does it play out? And so certainly it is a, a, a key component. So perhaps what we saw was in, in terms of our experience thus far is the easy part of our way. And so the next part will be when this and if this moves into poorer communities where we know social distancing is a problem and where we know hunger is an issue because how long will individuals stay at home where they have no food and where essentially, as we've even seen around the country in, South in, in Cape Town, for example, we know that there were food trucks that were looted. So it is this question of lives versus livelihoods. And I'll all, only point to one thing here, which is that the plan that government seems to be working towards, and I know there was a, a draft that was released uh, in the last day or two around a risk-adjusted approach. And so certainly uh, what struck me around this is that it, it appears to be the right thing to do is that we move towards a, 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 a removal of the, of the lockdown, but it is a risk adjusted approach. What points to is that there are risks. And so I, cert, I think that there's an acknowledgement of the fact that, that this is certainly, we're moving into a risky type of period. And so certainly that acknowledgement of course is, is, is to be welcomed from that perspective. I think that is probably as far as I can see all of the questions that I have at this stage. Uh, Let's see, one further one here. Okay, two further ones here. What sort of growth rates are you using in your valuation models for equities? Uh, <laughs> that's the difficult question. So we, for example, had our um, global macro forum yesterday. And so normally what we do at this point uh, is we would be essentially trying to get to uh, a consensus around global growth rates. And I can say to you is that that is an enormously difficult uh, exercise for us at this stage to the extent that what we said is relying at this stage with all of the uncertainty on global context is that uh, those growth rates at this stage in terms of the best minds out there and and a consensus rate is at this stage with a very wide divergence probably the best uh, rate that we can use at this stage and we know it's going to change at this stage because we know it's such a fluid situation so certainly at this stage our belief that we have a, a far superior insight outside of consensus is fairly limited. So we do not have high conviction calls around actual growth rates in terms of uh, the underlying uh, side of things. Certainly on a stock level, uh, when we look at our analysts are able to be more specific around the, the underlying uh, uh, stock and what the environment is. Uh, and so certainly I agree with what the this question that at the current index levels, the imputed growth rates are quite high, absolutely correct. Uh, and considering whether we should have negative growth, I think that's pretty much a given. We know that we live in a world which is uh, already in a global recession frame. Uh, this morning I read Joseph Stiglitz pointing to the fact that we are most likely moving towards, given the policy uh, implementation side of things and the, the, some of the leaders, is that there's a, a, a good possibility of global recession. And so certainly that, given his background, made me uh, sit up and think about this thing a little bit more uh, uh, carefully. In terms of exposure or view on uh, emerging market bonds, Africa bonds, uh, in US dollar terms or local currency. So certainly I would say this thing, is that on an emerging market bond component, there will come a time when it will be attractive. If you are a South African investor, certainly uh, our, I know our fixed income team have been uh, quite uh, optimistic around where yields got to and have loaded up to a certain degree on when bond yields got uh, to higher levels. So certainly it's a, in a good position at the moment. Where to from here though? Again, in our mind, when we are looking at a global level, then we would say at this stage, it is too early for us to want to say that we are bullish about emerging market bonds. Why? Because we would say, if I compared investment grade corporate bonds to emerging market sovereign bonds, 
the corporates, in particular US corporates, have a backstop because we've got the Fed in terms of their programs. And in terms of the yield spread pickup in those, those particular uh, uh, bonds, there's certainly uh, a comparable spread that we can see against some of the emerging market uh, sovereigns. So certainly at this point in time, we would say that the emerging market uh, side of things is probably lower down on the scale relative to investment grade corporates. Uh, and so certainly in, in, in dollar terms, we would be looking at it uh, again, the ability in, in, in US dollar terms, it depends on where the corporates are. Mostly at this stage, we're focusing on US dollar corporates, so it'd be USD, uh, rather than a global uh, uh, investment grade corporate at this stage. Uh, I think that is perhaps uh, where we've got to as far as um, questions are concerned. Um, if there's any others, I'll give it a few seconds to see if there are any others coming through. Uh, nothing further. So I think with, in the absence of any further questions, certainly I uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, as always, um, I pick up some of the difficult ones. Uh, uh, so certainly uh, uh, in terms of answering them, I think the answer here lies in the fact that our preferred approach is, is an understanding of the context that we're in. And so certainly it's, I would much rather in an overall context want to miss a little bit of the upside, but you have a higher conviction about the fact that this is not as the, 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 the parlance would go, a dead cat bounce. So I'd want to have a higher degree of conviction and certainty around the fact that uh, countries have implemented things successfully and that it is sustainable. And if we have that, then sure, then I believe uh, in terms of taking on, on that uh, risk would be appropriate. And certainly in that environment, we would also have a much higher degree of certainty around the in, implied or, or the expected growth rates uh, going forward. At this stage, too much uncertainty points us towards, uh, the, again, that differentiated risk approach of favoring the assets where you have transparency, where you have looked through, and where essentially you are able to have a backstop if possible. I think with that, I will end off there. Thank you very much for your attendance, and hopefully we will see you at our next uh, uh, presentation, and hopefully it won't be a webinar, but in, li in uh, a live side of things. Although, again, as I point out, it's probably somewhere down the line. Thank you very much and stay safe and stay home.